uh, seeing and understanding uh, climate change in our context and also how we are collaborating with community to uh, work together uh, to uh, you know, address some of the challenges they face in our community. So it is very much uh, uh, a journey of ADRA Laos and also our community that we work with. Okay, so uh, in terms of uh, ADRA Laos, how we are working uh, and having that intentional focus is uh, directed by numbers of uh, numbers of things. And obviously the first thing that uh, drives us to work in this space is obviously we work in a community. They are very vulnerable. And also uh, they have many challenges and issues that require support. And uh, so, and ADRA really uh, look at those challenges. And also we have looked at what is other uh, framework or other uh, you know, strategies out there that will help us to really tailor our work. So we have uh, in our national level, we've got a, a national socioeconomic development plan that also identify these challenges that uh, Laos is facing at the moment, especially with uh, climate changes. And also uh, in our ministry level, we have a number of uh, policies that uh, recognizes, and there's plenty of studies already been done and numbers of research has been done to really sort of uh, look at the challenges and look at the issues and identify those issues are real for the community that we work for. So they have really sort of also guided uh, with our community and these uh, national and ministry level body has guided us uh, that uh, there is something that uh, ADRA obviously as an organization we can do and we have that interest to work with our community that are in the need. So in terms of uh, our organizational, how we are uh, uh, addressing this uh, as part of community is also looking at our strategy and that strategic document also clearly states the challenges that are faced by our community and thus we have a plan to address that uh, through our uh, intentional strategy and that also has filtered through our strategic plan for 2023 and also a program strategy for 2023 to 2025. And we've also got a small uh, uh, team, we call it green team, uh, that comes under our Adrilas environmental policies. And I have a number of photos, but we just put this little one there. Uh, it's one of our staff uh, planting a seeds on a plastic one liters plastic bottles with the, so we are as a green team, they have a number of initiatives at the moment in our organization. We sort out all our rubbish, plastic papers and organic materials. And then we try to uh, uh, discard them uh, accordingly and also recycle them where we can, especially plastic bottles. We uh, take them to the recycling place and also paper, we uh, collect them and then we take to the place where we could sell that. Obviously, uh, it's also uh, you know, informed by our uh, which goals that we want to achieve through our sustainable development goal. So that's our roadmap on how we are uh, sort of working with the community. Uh, Obviously uh, for us, like uh, we have vulnerable communities in our uh, community that we work with and what that vulnerable communities uh, definitions looks like for us. And I'll put it up the definition. I'm just gonna read it through quickly, which is quite self-explanatory. Uh, so people who are particularly at risk of harm or disadvantage due to various 
factors such as poverty, lack of education, limited access to information, and inadequate infrastructures. These communities may include ethnic minorities, people with disability, women, children, and the elderly, amongst others. They are often exposed to various challenges such as food insecurity, limited health care, and educational facility, as well as inadequate infrastructures like roads and transportation systems. These challenges are of, often exacerbated by natural disasters such as floods and drought, as well as the impact of climate change. As a result, this community requires special attention and support to improve their livelihood, reduce their vulnerability, and enhance their well being. So, these uh, definitions has, uh, we have a number of documents when we write a proposals, when we uh, you know, try to explain our vulnerable communities. These words are quite uh, strongly uh, present in those uh, definitions. So, that that's how we understand our uh, vulnerable communities. Okay, so uh, I also have borrowed this uh, little uh, chart that really fits in with uh, how we look at our vulnerability and how we work, uh, work to uh, understand and support those vulnerability. So there are two areas we look at. We look at socioeconomic vulnerability and a vulnerable groups. In socioeconomic vulnerability, there are a number of uh, indicators, uh, human development uh, index, multi-dimension uh, poverty index, gender in inequality. So all those, uh, uh, those indicators that's there, that, that is really affecting uh, our community people. So it's, that's why, uh, you know, uh, it makes our community really vulnerable. Uh, this is the HDI, if you can see uh, on a slide, uh, we sit around 0 0.466. So the life expectancy is also quite low compared to the global people only lives up to 57.9 years and uh, schooling years is also less. So this is also making our community really vulnerable. Though we are not, thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Though we are not uh, on the red, we are on the orange. And uh, that's, also, uh, that's still quite a bit of a risk for uh, our community members. And also these indicators are obviously uh, for a gross uh, national statistic put together, but the community that we work in, they are even much more vulnerable. So this is also another indicators, MPI, that looks at nutrition, again, schooling, child mortality, housing, sanitation, electricity, uh, you can see Laos, it's really uh, in here, uh, you know, it's 0 0.108. So obviously uh, we are not as worse as some of these countries that sits up here, but we are, you know, we are not that great either. Okay, so these are some of our vulnerable groups that in our communities. So we've got a, uh, we work with children under five households and we also work with the community that have uh, natural disasters, uh, socks, and then also the community that really uh, uh, has issue with food insecurity. So they are the group of people, but we've also worked with uh, people with disability and ethnic minority uh, communities that are also uh, significantly uh, disadvantaged compared to other mainstream uh, Laolum uh, ethnic groups. So this is also another quick, uh, you know, uh, index that shows uh, that Laos uh, uh, ability to uh, you know, respond or be readiness for the disasters is not there. And then also uh, there is a significant issue with food, water, health, and eco-service. 
So all of these indicators, uh, there are a number of different indicators that all uh, refers that uh, Adra Laos is uh, quite a uh, vulnerable uh, communities. We have a lot of vulnerable community members in our uh, part of uh, Laos. So that's sort of, that's how we understand our vulnerability. So I think it's important in terms of for us to really understand what that vulnerability means for us. And this is the last one that I would like to share with you is uh, about the, uh, uh, the share of economic and uh, GDP, where it comes from. So uh, also, if you look at it, uh, you know, there's a three key uh, sectors. It looks at uh, agriculture, industry, and service. So in 2010, the statistic for uh, agriculture sectors coverage was 22.6% for its GDP. But in uh, 2020, uh, it is reduced to 16.2021. And also what's uh, important here is we have a large numbers of populations of our country, nearly about 70% farmers are subsistence farmers. So though there is a huge numbers of people uh, working in a, a farming sectors, uh, the, the gross domestic product is not increasing or it's not uh, getting a, a bigger chunk of the economic, but it is shrinking. So then that's obviously, uh, you know, uh, reflect on our farmers or our communities are uh, struggling in terms of their agriculture uh, productions or the livelihood uh, income that they generate through the uh, uh, farming work. Okay, so now uh, also we look, obviously uh, our communities where we work is not extremely uh, exposed to a direct uh, uh, natural disaster, uh, but they do have another uh, issues. Uh, you know, it's not uh, extreme at the moment, but they do suffer uh, droughts. There is occasional floods. And the main things they are struggling in terms of nature is uh, the unpredictability of the weather. So the weather is not as predictable as used to be. So the way they used to uh, plan their agriculture work, now they no longer they could do that. And of course, uh, there is uh, other natural disaster, but you know, it's not severe. They do suffer some droughts and flood. And also they have uh, numerous uh, pestilence issues and also livestock uh, diseases. So how uh, at the, uh, for us to really uh, try to prepare what we do for our family, uh, our community, uh, members in our community is we look at some of those uh, natural disasters and also the level of vulnerability they have and how they are coping, the capacities of their coping. Uh, also the coping capacity of the individual family in a community level, or also uh, look at institutionally, whether they are uh, able to uh, you know, respond if there is any greater shock. So these uh, three things really sort of helps us to uh, inform how we go and work into our communities. So basically the community that we work on they are exposed to the hazards. They are really vulnerable group of people and they also lack coping capacity. So they are the three key things. And obviously as uh, ADRA, we want to really understand that. So thus we, it helps us to uh, you know, uh, grow or it helps us to work with community. So uh, when uh, we uh, when we used to talk about climate change with some of our staff, uh, you know, about four or five years ago, 
I used to say, oh, is there any uh, issues with the climate change in our community? And, you know, often uh, their understanding was uh, weather changes. When I say climate change effects, they would understand it's a weather change. So a lot of the response would be, oh, yeah, you know, in the rain, uh, a lot of children get sick. And, you know, if uh, in the winters, uh, we will also have a lot of sick children. So that sort of used to be a response I used to get from uh, our project team. And even when I talked to our technical, uh, you know, our departmental officer that we closely work with in our district health office or district agriculture and forestry office, they would also respond to me in a very similar manner. So that's the context that we're really working on in our Laos. So thus, you know, it makes our community even much more vulnerable to this coming, uh, you know, this emerging uh, crisis also through climate change, adding extra burdens when they already have numerous of burden they're trying to overcome. So what we are currently doing is uh, we work on diversifying livelihood opportunity uh, as part of trying to make those community resilience. And uh, we also have a climate smart agriculture and also sustainable agriculture and natural resource management. So they are some of the work that was incorporated in our project. This is uh, obviously in the past and also we will continue to do this work and also some work on uh, safe food productions and also organic agriculture. We also have a nutrition sensitive agriculture uh, that really looks at uh, food security and food diversities. And then we have been also uh, quite intentional about uh, making sure that our programming or projects have a social inclusion component uh, integrated into it. So we have also people with disability household, and then we've also got a, a market literacy and uh, access to financial inclusion component in our work. So now uh, where we would like to go as an ADRA is, uh, we want to take a nature-based solution approach. And I know this is a very new uh, approach, uh, though a lot of the work, we uh, many uh, of us already doing it, but they have come up with the new terms to uh, explain this and also, uh, I guess, uh, you know, uh, try to mainstream it. So it's always in our forefront. So because of this uh, approach that we are looking at taking as our uh, uh, strategy for our uh, organization, Adra Laos here, we will be looking at working more in restoring and regenerative agriculture. We'll also be looking at forest community, forest stewardship, and also responsible agriculture invest, investment, uh, more on public-private partnership. And we will also explore carbon credit related market. Again, this is very new for us uh, in Laos, but we know this is something that will be also able to benefit our community because most of our communities are in an upland rural area that has a lot of community forest and also protected forest. So we are also focusing on uh, uh, getting to understand these sectors a little bit more. And then we will also be uh, investing in a lot of capacity building for our organization and also a civil society organization. We also work with local uh, civil society, a local NPA that holds here and also uh, the government counterpart. So we want to keep working with them uh, more so we can. Uh... OK, this is just the uh, one image that I borrowed from uh, IUCN, International Union for Conservation of Nature. And that came under that nature-based solutions document. So basically, uh, our community is not fully, uh, doesn't have a mountain, but it has a challenges of this. We have a lot of livestock uh, overgraze land in our community that we work with. And there's also uh, invasive non-natives plants 
and we are also experience a lack of water management, there is erosion. So these pictures really sort of uh, tells us uh, some of the challenges we are facing uh, at the moment in our community. And also the issue with soil erosion and deforestation is uh, also uh, the challenge for us. So based on that, obviously we want to apply these nature-based solutions uh, that will uh, help us improve our community. So, uh, and the, I would probably go to the next slide, so hopefully. So basically the challenges that we have we want to really look at addressing that with having that fo focus of protecting the current uh, natural resource that the community has. So they have uh, much more uh, much more resilience as a community so they can support their livelihood uh, through all other means that also support their uh, agriculture systems. So this is also some of the uh, quick principle that we said we will, uh, adhere and uh, follow as an organization. And I'm just gonna read a couple of them because they are quite a bit there. So we want to obviously embrace and nature conservation's norm principle. So again, just looking at all the uh, natural uh, landscape and natural resource that we have, and we want to conserve that, but also be able to use sustainably. So, and there are a number of principles we will be looking at on how we will be doing that with our community. So obviously the desired outcomes to apply this principle is to uh, you know, have a climate resilience community. That is one of our main uh, outcome that we would like to see. Okay, so, so how are we doing that? So basically in terms of our agriculture work, uh, we have a number of different projects. So some of the things we do is we uh, do a community vulnerability assessment into our community. So we can basically uh, gauge what sort of, uh, you know, natural disasters they've been exposed to and what sort of uh, impact it's been causing what kind of frequency uh, they are exposed to and what are their current coping mechanisms. So is it uh, adequate? And if there are challenges that uh, beyond or their uh, ability to respond or if there is a lack of awareness or understanding or knowledge around that, then we will try to uh, work together with them and try to come up with a plan to address that. So we, are incorporating that uh, in our number of projects. So I've just put a couple of projects there. And we also do comprehensive community planning. So this exercise we do with each community. So again, understanding all different issues. Uh, so this is also goes beyond our vulnerability assessment. It looks at gender, it looks at other component. Uh, it does uh, resource mapping and does number of other things. So we really understand where our community is. And also some of our things that we're working uh, with our community and our uh, implementing partners uh, is climate smart agriculture. So one of the things we're doing is uh, trying to create a dynamic seasonal crop calendar. So what that means is obviously the uh, weather is changing so at the moment, a lot of our farmers are, you know, expecting to uh, plan their crops based on what they've done for generation. So, and the practice is, well, uh, if it comes to a certain period of times in a year, that's when I will clear the land. And when it comes to the certain period of time, that's when I will plant and expect that there's going to be a rain. So farmers are really work understanding the weathers like that. So we are trying to help farmers look, there are uh, other resources that are available. And we also have some of those uh, uh, resource that is available locally. So we also work really closely with our government partners and uh, that they also facilitate us to uh, work with community to uh, health these challenges. 
And also there are a number of other things. I'm not going to go through all of them, but some of the things that we look at is soil improving, how to improve the soil, and also apply some methods to improve the soil, and also uh, look at extending the period of uh, crop productions by uh, using greenhouse in a certain uh, areas uh, that is, uh, you know, that is beneficial for community. So we've also got a climate and market farmer field school. So we've just started this with our new project called Sali, uh, which also uh, has a component of uh, climate smart innovation grant, and they are mainly targeting to the farmer level group. So when farmers identify their challenges, uh, especially the one with the climate change uh, related issues, and you know they are also work they work together with the team to prepare a small grant that will help them to be uh, climate smart farmers. So at the moment uh, we are collecting a lot of those small uh, uh, climate smart innovations grant. So the, that will be rolled out in next few months. We also got a livestock management. Our farmers, like I said, they are 70% subsistence farmers and livestock is a huge part of their livelihood and uh, protecting them and making that systems uh, uh, quite uh, you know, strong systems is, uh, we believe that will help our community to be resilient. And also the community have expressed they want to do that. So we have been really working uh, into improving life, livestock management. And also seed sovereignty. Uh, most of the farmers that we have, about 80% of farmers, our farmers use their own local seed. However, there are a lot of new seeds coming in and obviously there is a good and bad of the new seeds. So we are also uh, encouraging our farmers to maintain their own seed sovereignty so they can keep collecting, harvesting their seed, and they can also integrate some of the other seeds that is also have a numbers of benefits, so, but not losing that seed they have. So that's also how we are working with our community to continually make them res resilient. There's also a huge challenges with poor ha post harvest. There is a significant loss of crop, and also there is a significant issue with the uh, infrastructures related that supports that post harvest for our farmers. But we are working in that area, uh, implementing good agriculture practice, and also having an engagement with a policy uh, influencer to uh, you know uh, have a policy dialogues with them. And that's how also we are working to really strengthen our agriculture practices within the community that are very vulnerable. So this is how we are working with our communities to make them resilience in their agriculture practice and their agriculture, because that's their livelihood. If they lose that, if they're not able to make that agriculture compatible uh, in coming future, then they're going to be uh, significantly affected. So we are also uh, working towards sustainable grazing management. So there are some work we've already doing it, but some work we are also looking at expanding. So we work on rotational grazing uh, for uh, livestock, and we also promote cotton carry methods. Uh, usually we have an issue where uh, people just leave their uh, livestock walks around, roams around, and you know it has many uh, issues uh, with environment and also with uh, how, how they manages their animal. So we're also promoting fencing and feeding animals. We also support them with growing different varieties of uh, grass and also uh, supporting in uh, nutri nutrient block for the uh, bigger uh, uh, livestock. And we also uh, have a livestock farmer group that work together collectively uh, in, in each community that we work. 
So another work that we are uh, also uh, continuously working and will continue to work is this natural resource management. Usually the community that we have, they have some sort or form of land use planning and some uh, really uh, follows it and uh, some don't. So because uh, the trend is already there in our community, uh, for them to really uh, uh, create a land use plan for their village. Uh, it has helped in some community, but it still needs more work for those community that have, but not been implementing correctly and also continues continue uh, to working on those community that they don't have. This is again, another uh, participatory uh, uh, activity, they spend, uh, you know, numbers of days with the community uh, to create uh, their land use plan, they demark, you know, which area is for agriculture, which area is for protective, which area is a buffer zone, which area is for uh, agriculture cultivation. So there's a number of, uh, and we work very closely with our government uh, uh, department partners and our team uh, with the community. So that community really sort of gets into the, uh, into, you know, this whole process or else, um, you know, there is sometimes challenges of not adapting or adopting these plans that they've created. So we will also, uh, we also been working in uh, community forest uh, management in some of the communities that we work with we are supporting them on a tree planting and also uh, some of our new project that we are going to be implementing will be really uh, looking at establishing a community forestry management for, for uh, each community as well. And uh, this is also a huge issue for us in Laos. Uh, um, obviously, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, land clearing we have a lot of burning issues. We have a lot of slash and burn. So it's just trying to uh, raise a lot of awareness with the community that those forests they have is theirs, but it's how they manage will have an implication to their livelihood and their resilience. So basically having those communications and setting some score, small goals with them uh, to you know having those forests with uh, them for a long time. Okay, so also uh, another component that we do is uh, strengthening uh, institutional capacity and advocacy uh, in terms of our communities and the government now work, uh, worker that we work with, uh, we, we do feel uh, there is a significant gap in there and uh, because they are also very much uh, integrated in our implementations, we in, in spend and invest quite a bit of time uh, building that institutional capacity uh, and also the community level capacity. Uh, so they are the sum of the work we're doing. Uh, and also, as I said, we also are start to engaging on policy dialogue work with them, with our uh, government counterparts. Okay, there's also some market and financial inclusion on market for our current projects and also uh, for a farmer group, we are working to uh, develop a business plan based on their group uh, compositions and the crops they produce, which is, uh, we've just done that uh, in, um, I think last month. So we're working with about 55 farmer groups and now they all have an operational business plan. So based on those business plan, they will be looking at preparing a, a business grant. So they also have access to a business grant. Okay, some of the lesson learned for us, I mean, there are a lot more than this, but I just, put it up some there. So it's obviously taking us a lot longer to uh, bring a change, especially 
uh, you know, when we are working in such a remote communities, uh, they are so much used to uh, doing their traditional way. And then also uh, a lot of our uh, target groups, they are not highly literate or educated. And you've also seen, you know, the schooling year is really low. And then as we go into the remote places, they are even lower. So for them to really uh, understand a new concept, or even though they know that would help, it takes definitely taking us a lot longer to bring a change that we want to bring in terms of uh, you know, making them resilient through some of the new agriculture practices. And we also uh, significantly lack uh, technical expertise and the facilitating skill set within the within the network and the resource and the partners that we have that are responsible to implement uh, this work. So there's a significant uh, technical expertise lack lacking there. That's why we work in a multi uh, cross sectoral uh, organization. So we bring different uh, skill set and try to work together and also, uh, you know, cross fertilize those uh, uh, knowledge and uh, expand those knowledge beyond one sector. So we are also that's also a significant issue we've got in terms of you know looking how to make uh, our community really uh, sort of uh, uh, resilience. Uh, also, uh, crop production systems, like uh, they are not, though we have a, a accessible information about the weather, you know, there is a forecast and there's also information if they provide on uh, what sort of uh, climate challenges they may have in this next, next three months, you know, what they should be looking at, uh, what, what method they should be applying or uh, what types of pestilence they should be aware of. Even though these knowledge are available there, uh, we are finding quite difficult to take those information to the community and also community really understanding those information and then community accessing that information directly. So that's also been a, quite a bit of challenge for us. And also, uh, you know, just the whole understanding about the climate change. Uh, when we talk about climate change, the, uh, the understanding is still very uh, basic in the community. Even though they identify there is some trend or there is some change, the knowledge is very limited. So it, in, in a way that there is a lot more uh, work needs to be done still just to get them understanding uh, what that change is going to look like and what the implication is going to be uh, for your community. So these are the challenges that we have. And also, obviously, some challenges are much bigger than uh, what project can, uh, you know, uh, address. We have uh, much more uh, bigger issues with investment and poor infrastructures and which we try to raise it and try to lobby with the government. So, okay, so this is, uh, this is how uh, we are working uh, with our community. And obviously uh, climate change context is really different for each location and each geographical area. Uh, and you know you will have obviously a different response. So this is how we've been doing. So I think I've taken more time than I had. Uh, so I would like uh, to ask if you have any questions, uh, then I may be able to answer quickly if I have time. Saliji. Uh, thank you, Suras. It was very interesting presentation. Colleagues, now time for Q and A. You can type in, or if you would like, you can raise your hand and uh, unmute your mic and speak. Uh, Shuras, can you please stop uh, sharing this screen? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.
Okay, Mr. Yes, Sorbonne. Sorry. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for a very nice presentation. Very interesting. Um, I, I, I had a few points where I would like you, if you maybe could elaborate a little bit, uh, because you, you you said one thing was that that uh, you had some challenge that lack of technical expertise uh, or to the facilitators. Um, you you said you kind of put knowledge together. You you kind of subtract it from different sources, but practically, yeah. how are you doing it, and how would you approach it differently going at, going forward? Thank you. <sighs> Well, that is uh, also a difficult question, Soren. I don't have an easy answer to that, but we have a different department. So we have a department of land management and they uh, seems to have some expertise around uh, climate change and climate services. But that department actually sit outside the district agriculture and forestry department. So there is a disconnection between these two departments. So what we have done is we have taken our uh, district agriculture and forestry officers from all our district. We have uh, gathered together all our uh, staff and also our uh, nonprofit associations, uh, local NGOs, partners. And then we have uh, conducted number of training so that uh, they have that will help them to uh, be much more uh, resilient in terms of you know uh, adapting to some of the agricultural practices for uh, changing climate. So looking at the soil, also looking at the weather and you know weather forecast and how you can plan your uh, agricultural productions around that. So having said that. Uh, so those knowledge are really uh, new even for our district counterpart. So they are really grappling uh, to really understand they've got a resource, they've got everything, but making that really relevant to community is ongoing work. And I think we will have to continue work on that, be patient and also look at other opportunity, how we can do that. So that's, that's a, a very good question. Uh, but it's still it's still a lot of work to do. Yeah, thank you, Soren. Quinton. Thank you. I can see Quinton raising his hand. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. And uh, maybe along along the same or similar lines as what uh, Soren has just asked in terms of you know, how you convey information. And I think my key question is around ADRA being a community development organization, traditionally, not necessarily an environmental one. How do you go about the balance of, of livelihood generation for farmers who are tending, tending to want to exploit the resources around them as a primary way of generating income with those of educating on climate change and the value of sustainable development? And again, really good questions. <laughs> yes, and we are not a, that's why I said this is our journey. Like we've, we've actually, uh, had a journey from the beginning or, you know, uh, for the last six, seven years. Though ADRA Laos has done a number of things in the past that has made, uh, you know, that had already had a resilience component in it or supported the good agriculture practice that could, you know, uh, uh, that could uh, face some of the climatic changes and withheld some of those stresses. So we were already doing it. Uh, so now I guess we are just becoming a bit more, uh, you know, intentional. And uh, so trying to grow in that path. And also, I mean, I guess uh, I'm not saying we have to follow what the global focus is. Obviously, the global focus also influence our decision where we want to go, because that's where the language is being used. That's where the funding is there, you know. I've even UNICEF and people that's working with the children, I mean, they are saying, you know, climate change affects children and women. Yes, it does. You know, you go to the World Health Organization, they are saying climate change affects health. You know, so we do live in that world, even though that's why I wanted to really stress in the beginning, it has to be really contextual. So for us, 
we look at how our community are really vulnerable, you know, and there is a number of factors, social factors, and there is a institutional factors already making us really, really uh, vulnerable. Uh, and then of course, then we've got an added, uh, you know, natural disaster that we are hoping to get those frequency more and it's becoming unpredictable. So based on those types of uh, thinking as a ADRA a developmental organization that did not really work on those areas, we thought it is a need for us where we work. It's different again, you know, it could be different for all country uh, offices, but because we work into those community, uh, if the increased climate change effect could significantly impact them when they are already vulnerable. And I think there was another component of questions. I don't know without I able to answer that. Did I answer all of your component? There was one component, I think. I. Uh, yeah, I think that was the main point. Just, yeah, how, how you contextualize the climate change into a livelihood model. Yeah, um, sorry. Then, I think, the, yeah, livelihood that. Uh, so also the basically looking at their natural resources, you know, for them, uh, a lot of those natural resources is used to maintain their livelihood and they've just used it. So now we are trying to work with them to, hey, come on, we have to have a system that will not just really nearly just use those natural resources that we have. So it's a bit of a challenge again there, uh, trying to you know uh, uh, work together with them, uh, but uh, hopefully uh, we will be able to <laughs> work together and we will have much more story to tell in the next few years how that goes with the community. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Is so there a message? Uh, is there a question in a chat box? Oh yeah. So is the wrong reason here? Community. I'm wondering if in the communities where you are implementing multiple community level, is there a central community level group that oversee all intervention? Uh, basically, there's a community level like for disaster response to us effort like community for. Okay, so we have uh, a central. So our in our uh, area that we work with. Our district administration's office plays uh, those main central uh, entity that try to manage all of that. So when we do our community forestry plan, management plan into the community, those community management plan then will come to uh, our district uh, forestry and agriculture office. Also, it comes to uh, district land uh, environment, uh, envir uh, Don Ray natural resource and environment uh, department. There is another department. So those collaboratively work to work together. And then when they combined uh, what that looks like, then it will go uh, to get uh, approval and oversee and also support us in implementations by district administration's office in each district and then they also have a community level group in a community so there are two levels and uh, we are also trying to uh, link that because at the moment there is also a huge uh, uh, push on land tenure, tenure security uh, in our uh, Laos because a lot of those land that has been used in a community are not fully registered. So the idea is if we are start to registering all those land, it not just uh, protects the land, provide the security for the land for the users, but it's also provide a better use of the land. So those conversations are also occurring in a national level. And then of course, those uh, community level produce a land use plan also be able to filter through in a national level. So that's also a work in a progress at the moment. There is a number of uh, uh, support there already. So we, yeah. So I hope that answered your question there, uh, Rachel. Thank you, sir. 
How, how do you pronounce your name? I'm sorry, Sir Siraj. It's Siraj, yes. Great. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I uh, that does answer my questions. It's great that you have the the governmental structures in place to to even receive the community level planning that you're doing. Um, so I, I I was just curious, and and maybe I, I think you have answered, but um, if at your community level, is there a group that is not only looking at what do we do? if we have a disaster or, or if we have a, you know, in your, um, you mentioned like comprehensive community planning groups. I just wondered if that encompassed both like disaster response, like what do we do if there's a pest, you know, killing all of our crops or, or, a, or a flood, are they, are they looking at response plus also what can we do to make sure that we aren't impacted by a disaster? Yes, those uh, those things are identified, but like I said, uh, we won't be able to respond to all of those. And sometimes we work within the scope of the project. So how we've allocated our resource through that project, we do uh, uh, you know use those resources where we can. But the area that we don't have a resource, we also uh, because we're working so close with government and there is a quite a bit of a coordinations where we work in terms of government. Uh, it is, it can be good things. It can also be a bad thing. Where we work, it's a forced coordinations and cooperation collaboration where we have no choice. So because of that factors is there, we can also, it can also significantly disadvantage us in our uh, implementation, because we really rely uh, in that partnership. So, but having said that, there is those uh, collaborations. Because of those collaboration, what happened is they are also uh, communicating with number of other stakeholders. So those stakeholders can also be part of meeting some of the gaps that we're not able to uh, address. So in that way, uh, basically project, we can only address what the scope of project that we have. So if we are looking at addressing pestilence, we can. So if we're looking at a, a disease prevention on a livestock, a uh, number of different diseases, we can. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. So sure, Thank uh, you. I have a question on climate uh, farmers field So okay. I was wondering, how does it differ from the regular farmers really school that we usually understand. Okay, it's it's not really differed. Again, like there is a little bit of a, uh, obviously we all uh, have a similar foundation of farmer field school, uh, really focus on, you know, learning by applying and learning by uh, testing and learning by doing, learning by sharing. So we try to, we have a same uh, philosophy and we try to apply that into field. So a lot of practical stuff is there and working within the farmer groups and their members. But we also have a component where they will uh, sit and in a classroom setup. So that's a little bit different for us. And that, that's again, I think it's a contextual for us. We, uh, we have a trainers, uh, especially the government trainers, they have a set ways of doing certain training and they can't seem to do that outside the class. So we also have, so it's a bit of a hybrid uh, class. So would that answer my, your question, Salilji, or? Yeah, that, that was uh, helpful. And one more question I had uh, before we have. Uh, you talked about climate smart innovation grant. Is it for the group or is it for the individual? And what are the some of the eligible activity that you uh, okay. are planning so, to support? Well, uh, so that's uh, again really good question. So, <laughs> and we actually just prepared those eligibility criteria about two months ago, and. So even to prepare those eligibility criteria, we had to really work with the uh, government partners because 
we had to get the approval for them to say this uh, this is right thing to do. So it took mm -hmm. a bit of a time to prepare those. So basically uh, what we have identified is there is a uh, issue with the water, uh, issue with the pestilence, issue with the soil. And also, uh, you know, if there is any innovative thing that community thinks beyond maybe our understanding, but they mm -hmm. can justify that this will help them to be a climate uh, smart or it is a climate innovative. So uh, so it, I know it meant to be really innovative, but it's probably not um, going to be that innovative compared to our world world, you know, uh, a level field. But you know, if it's a, a innovative within the community that we work in and if that can justify the panels and we've got a panel, uh, of independent uh, uh, panel that sort of uh, reviews all those uh, uh, e eligibility and also, uh, you know, whether that is uh, climate smart or not, or climate innovative or not. So it's still not a very uh, stringent, uh, you know, uh, detailed criteria. It's got uh, quite a, um, uh, there is a flexibility for farmer to really uh, uh, present. And we've also got our officers and the district officers are working with those community groups. So this is mainly targeted at the farmer group level. So if, this is not for the individuals. So if the farmer groups level uh, come up with some nice uh, uh, approach, it could be very simple approach. And we think that's a little bit newer approach that would help the farmer to make them resilient. Then obviously the panel will decide. So we have a um, number of uh, uh, government partner there. We have project uh, office, uh, project manager. We have program team there. And we also have our NPA representative there. So it's a very bureaucratic uh, uh, selection panel. Uh, sometimes that's why it takes us a lot longer to mm -hmm. longer to do things. Uh, but you know it's okay because it it takes time. I think the timeline sometimes dictated upon us by our donor partners. But I think uh, the, the 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 reality is it takes time. So we will just have to keep working with the community that we work with. And obviously, some communities are much better than others. So, you know, so there's also that factors there. Thank you, Salilji. I hope I yeah, answered. Thank you, sir. So I think we are already at the end of our planned one hour session. Uh, thank you yeah. for the- Can nice I just respond to one, one question? Sorry, one comment there is a- uh, uh, Oh, I'm sorry for that. If everyone is no, happy to continue- Is that okay? That, Can that, I do one more? Okay. Yeah, please, sure. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I'm happy with what is starting my institute of operation project, mainly on agriculture. We would we would wish to adopt their lives. How is it done in schools, primary schools? Oh, okay, okay. And what are some of the lesson? What primary schools? Okay, sorry. We uh we don't do anything with the primary school. Uh, and what are some of the lessons? Sorry, we don't do anything with the school, especially primary school. We work children under five, that is our nutrition project. So, but those community that we work in, they have a high malnourishment, mal yeah, they have a really uh, high numbers of stunting, wasting and underweight. So uh, we work with the household level. So sorry, maybe there was a little bit of misunderstanding there. I think there is no more questions and Thank you, everybody. And uh, again, like I just like to say one last thing. Uh, you know, this wasn't meant to be any technical uh, climate uh, sort of methodology I was going to share. This is mainly a journey, our journey as an organization, and also our community journey on how we are seeing vulnerability, what it means, how we understand climate change and also trying to understand some of, you know, scientific uh, rational behind it and trying to make that 
practical to our community. So we are still growing. There are a lot of room for growth. So I hope I did not, uh, uh, you know, have a different expectation. So this is much more like a very personable, uh, subjective community, you know, uh, our collective sort of experience we shared with you. Thank you very much for- uh, Thank you. Team. Thank you, Suraj. Thank yeah. you, everyone. Thank Thanks, Suraj. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you.